Hey guys, Mr. L coming back at you with another video. And in this video, we're gonna talk about quantum mechanics. We're gonna focus on electrons and how they vibrate into di different mode shapes. So we're gonna talk about quantum numbers, as well as we're gonna talk about electron configurations and the three notations to signify these different electron configurations. So let's get into this video. So the first thing in this video we're going to talk about is the idea of Schrodinger's wave equation. So we have these electrons and they're going to vibrate into these different modal shapes. And we learned last video that Bohr model that allowed different orbital areas where electrons could exist in. But the problem with his model is that he had electrons orbiting the nucleus similar to planets around the sun. And we know that this is not really the case. So Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, came up with the idea of using a wave equation. And the wave equation is going to be these density cloud regions or probability functions. They're going to show us where electrons can exist as. So the symbol we use for Schrodinger's equation is Greek letter psi, which looks like a trident. The most useful information, though, comes from the squared value of psi, psi squared. And that will give us our electron density outputs, which are, again, just cloud regions. So we have these quantum numbers which are going to describe these different cloud regions in which electrons can exist in. And now let's go over these different cloud regions. So to describe the cloud regions, we're going to use four quantum numbers. The first quantum number here we have is called the principal quantum number. And the principal quantum number denotes energy. So the values of these are symbolized using n, and they can be whole number integers from 1 all the way to infinity. N equals 1, again, is called the ground state, if we remember from the last video. And this is the lowest possible energy level that an electron can exist in. It's the one that's closest to the nucleus. And then you're going to put in a quanta of energy, and that quanta of energy is going to be absorbed by the electron at N equals 1. And depending on that quanta that you've shot at the electron, that photon with energy, is going to promote it to N equals 2 or 3 or 4 all the way out to infinity. So the principal quantum number is telling us the energy level with the electron ex ex existing in. The second quantum number we have here is called the angular momentum quantum number. And we symbolize this with lowercase l. The way that we calculate l is n minus 1 and all values below. So if n equals to 1, we subtract 1 from 1, then l would be equal to 0. And this counts as a value. If we had n equal to 2 and we subtract 1, then we could have possible values 1 and 0. Because again, it's all values below. If n is 3, then we would get 2, 1, and 0. And if n was 4, we would get 3, 2, 1, and 0. What these values represent, l equals 0, is called the s orbital. So the angular momentum quantum number is telling you the shape. An S orbital is a sphere shape, so it's a spherical shape. When L is equal to 1, we have the P orbital, and it can have three different shapes, but all of them are this dumbbell shape, or an infinity side, with a node in the middle. When we've got L is equal to 2, we call this the D orbital, and we get more elaborate, abstract shapes, where we've got these four lobe structures, as well as this double lobe, kind of looks like a P orbital with the donut ring around the middle lobe there. And then when L is equal to three, this is the F orbital, and then they've got even more extravagant shapes after this with all these lobes going into different areas. So what the angular momentum quantum number is telling us is the shape of the orbital. The third quantum number that we have here is called the magnetic quantum number, and we symbolize this with symbol m. And the values of m are going to be from negative l to l, so it's going to be a range. So if you go through and calculate your angular momentum quantum numbers, your l values, and your l is equal to zero, like in the case of an s orbital, it's going to be from negative l to l. So it'd be negative zero to zero, and that's just one value, it's zero. And zero does count as a value. Therefore, s orbitals, when l equals 0, m equals 0, and that's going to tell you we have one spatial orientation or one dimension. So what, the, so what the magnetic quantum number is telling us is how many spatial orientations or dimensions we have. If we've got l is equal to 1, in the case of a p orbital, our range of m values would be negative 1, 
zero, and one. So we have three possible spatial orientations or three dimensions that we could have for p orbital, the x, the y, and the z dimension. If we have l equal to two, the d orbital, our range would be negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So that's telling us we have five spatial orientations for a d orbital. And the last one, where l is equal to three, we've got negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, and three for our magnetic values, our m values. So the f orbital has seven dimensions, or seven spatial orientations. So this is a pattern by odd numbers. One, three, five, and seven for S, P, D, and F, respectively. One thing to note here is that when we start to talk about ones that have multiple dimensions or spatial orientations, like a P, a D, or an F shell, where it's got suborbitals under there, we have to talk about what is degenerate energy. So the word degenerate in chemistry and physics class is gonna have a different meaning than the common usage of the word. Degenerate in chemistry class means equal in energy. So if we have something like the p orbital, which has three dimensions, the x, the y, and the z dimension, one is not more energetic than the rest. They're all degenerate or equal in energy. So the x, the y, and the z dimension all have equivalent energy values associated with them. The fourth and final quantum number that we have here is called the spin quantum number. And there's two possible values that you could have for your spin value. You could have a plus one half, which signifies an up spin for the electron, and you could have a negative one half, which corresponds to a down spin for the electron. So each subshell from the magnetic quantum value, if you have one, three, five, or seven dimensions, each dimension can fit a total of two electrons, and they both must have opposite spin states. So within a subshell with two electrons, one would have to have an up spin and the other a down spin. We found in about the 1920s using super strong magnets that we could pull the spin states apart from each other up and down spin. And we found that these different spin states actually have different energies corresponding to these different spin states. So now when we start to visualize what an atom and electron is actually looking like, it's not really like the Bohr model where we've got a nucleus and then we've got electrons orbiting like circles around the nucleus. It's actually that we have these elaborate vibrational modes where the electron is this wave particle and it's vibrating in this probability region that could be a sphere shape or a dumbbell shape or like a dumbbell with a donut ring around it, depending on the energy associated with that vibrational mode. A really important vocab word that we're gonna need here is to understand what a node is. And if any of you have ever played a string instrument and you pluck the string like on a guitar, you could see the guitar string wobbling, but there are going to be certain regions where you see that the string seems like it's not wobbling at all. This is called the nodal region. Electrons also have node regions of vibrations or lack of vibrations, and those are going to be areas where the electron essentially does not exist. So when we're talking about n equals one, two, three, and we're talking about the s orbital, you've got a sphere within a sphere within a sphere, and there are gonna be nodal regions between these different spheres where the electrons are not gonna overlap and they're essentially not gonna exist in those areas. So what this whole Schrodinger wave equation is telling us are where we're most likely gonna find these regions of where the electron could exist in. The more energy that an electron has, the more nodal regions it's gonna have. So there are three different ways that we can show electron configurations or how the electrons fill around a nucleus for a given element. Let's start with the simplest element, hydrogen, and let's look at its first diagram called an orbital diagram. Orbital diagrams take the most work to actually write out because you're gonna write each sublevel with the subscript notation, as well as you're gonna draw a little line with showing all these arrows. So if you have a really massive element with a lot of electrons, you're gonna have a lot of arrows on your paper. Let's start with this simple one, hydrogen. So we could see that the four quantum numbers are there in this small little diagram. The one outside of the one S is telling us the energy level that's gonna fill first, it's energy level one. If we take N, which is one, and we subtract one, we get zero, which stands for an s orbital. So that's where this s comes from. 
Our magnetic values range from negative L to L, and if our value of L is zero, then our M value is also zero, which tells us we have one spatial orientation, which is why we have one line in which we could put two possible electrons in. That's our one spatial orientation. And then our last quantum number, generally we draw up spins first in each subshell. So this is why we have an up arrow showing that we've got an up spin. So these are our four quantum numbers for hydrogen. We could see something different like helium's orbital diagram. Now we're starting to pair electrons as an up and a down spin state into each subshell. And just a reminder, each subshell can only take two possible electrons. So now we're gonna go over the three major rules to doing the game of electron configurations. The first rule to the game is called the Aufbau principle. And the Aufbau principle states that electrons fill the lowest energy orbital first before filling the next. So you've got this nice schematic here in which you can see the electrons are going to fill first. I'm also going to show you on the periodic table these different blocks towards the end of the video, and eventually you should be able to just read the periodic table and not depend on the Aufbau diagram. But if you want to memorize this diagram and know the lines go through 1s and then 2s and so forth, you're welcome to do that. So we can see the Aufbau diagram is just a pattern. The 1s is always the lowest energy orbital, and that will fill first. Then will come the 2s, and then after 2s we have 2p. And after 2p, we have 3s, 3p, 4s, and then we've got 3d. So whenever you hit the d block, and when I start to show you the blocks, you need to subtract 1 from the n value. Same thing with when you get to the f block, which you're going to need to subtract 2 from the f block value, then 1 for the d block value, and then go back to the original n value. And when you start to look at the periodic table, this will start to make more sense. The second rule to the game is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And what this states is that no two electrons in a given atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. So there must be at least one quantum number that must be different within a given atom. Two or more can be different, but at least one must be different. So in the case of hydrogen or helium here, if you look at helium's orbital diagram, we can see they're both in the 1s, so the n value is both one for both of these electrons. The l value is zero, so they're both in the s orbital, so that value would be the same. If l is equal to zero, m is equal to zero once again, so they're both in the same subshell. So therefore, they must have different spin values in the case of helium, one electron with a plus one half value and one electron with a negative one half value. They can't both have the same with the up spin because then all four of the values would be the same and that would be violating the Pauli exclusion principle. The last rule to the game is called Hund's rule. And what Hund's rule states is that when you have degenerate orbitals or suborbitals like P, D, and F, once again, that have three, five, and seven spatial orientations, an electron with the same spin value must be given to each one of these subshells before you begin to pair them. And the analogy I like to use is a pizza party. If I had all my students in a room to have a pizza party and I had a whole bunch of pizza slices, would it be fair for me to get 70 slices of pizza, give one slice of pizza to the next person and have everyone with no pizza? No, that's not usually how we have a pizza party in class. We would have one slice of pizza for everybody, and if we had next seconds, if we had enough pizza for seconds, then everyone can get a second slice of pizza. Electrons are gonna behave the same way. The other thing to note about Hund's rule is that you would gonna, you're gonna wanna put an electron with the same spin in each dimension before you start pairing them. You're not gonna pair up the X dimension and leave the Y and the Z dimension to be empty, no. The other analogy I like to use is if you've got siblings, would you want to share room with your sibling versus each have your own room? I think most of you say, would say that you would like to have your own room from your sibling. Electrons behave this way too. Electrons are both negatively charged, so they're going to want to repel each other and get as far away from each other as possible. So they're going to want to fill these different subshells before they start pairing with each other. So these are the three rules of the game when you start to do orbital diagrams. 
So we could see here, here are a bunch of different orbital diagrams. And we could see that the more and more electrons we have, the longer it's going to take to write these orbital diagrams with all these up and down arrows. So chemists have come up with a more streamlined way of doing this, and that's called electron configuration notation. You're going to lose some of that visual data of seeing each electron spin state, whether it's spinning up or down, but we replace this with a superscript or an exponent. So when we're talking about the s orbital, an s orbital has one spatial orientation, so it can take a maximum of two electrons. The highest superscript value we can have on s then is a two. So if we're doing something like helium, its electron configuration would be one s two. If we were to do something like neon, we would have one s two, two s two, and then our next subcategory would be p, which has three spatial orientations that can each take two electrons for a total of six electrons. So the superscript on P would be a six here. D is gonna take a maximum of 10, and F can take a maximum of 14 electrons. So then we just write it this way to save time. The least informative but quickest way to do this is called noble gas configuration notation. And what we would do in this case is we would take some element say we had chlorine, for example, you need to go back on the periodic table to the previous noble gas before chlorine. And if you see that, that's neon. Neon has 10 electrons. So for noble gas configuration notation, what we would do is we would take neon, we'd put it in brackets, and that neon in brackets is gonna represent our 10 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and we don't need to write that. It's gonna be symbolized with neon. Then we would just continue our configuration using our electron configuration notation after the noble gas in brackets. So we would have noble gas neon in brackets. Then we would have 3s2, 3p5 in the case of chlorine, and this would be its noble gas configuration notation. So there it is, you guys. There's the video on quantum numbers, electron configuration notation, and quantum mechanics. If you enjoyed this video, if you like this video, smash the like button, send it to your favorite aunt, send it to your favorite lemur, and we'll see you in the next video.